Hey there, Wafters, Mr. Lasseter here, and in this video we're going to be looking at the early Ming Empire, uh, which comes about in 1368 and will last uh, into the 1600s. This video we're just going to look at it until about 1500. Uh, so let's talk about the Mongol foundation of this Ming Empire. Uh, a former monk and bandit, Zhu Yuanzhang, uh, established the Ming Empire in 1368. The Mongol regime of the Yuan dynasty had begun to, to weaken, and there was a lot of uh, interior unrest in China uh, that were trying to fight to push the Mongols out uh, to the north. And Zhu Yuanzhang, um, his regime basically, or his, his uh, leadership, uh, forces the Mongols north in China and pushes them out of China, basically ending the Yuan Empire. Uh, his regime establishes a new capital city in Nanjing, uh, and they have a, make a great effort of trying to get rid of Mongol influence, uh, and they reject uh, por uh, parts of Mongol culture, including trade relations with Central Asia and the Middle East. Uh, they try to reassure, reassert uh, Confucian ideology, um, and, and basically cast off the Mongol uh, presence. Uh, the movement of the capital city from Beijing to Nanjing is emblematic of this, although it will eventually move back. At a deeper level, though, the Ming actually continue a lot of the practices that the Yuan dynasty or the Yuan Empire had introduced. Uh, these included the provincial structure, uh, professional categories, the use of the Mongol calendar, and later on, uh, Beijing will once again, once again become the capital of China. Uh, here you see the picture of uh, Zhu Yuanzhang, who adopts the name Emperor Hong Wu uh, as he becomes the first emperor of the Ming Dynasty. From 1405 to 1433, a later Ming emperor, Yung Law, uh, is, attempts to re-establish trade connections that had been given up basically, by uh, the early Ming emperors. Uh, he dispatches a series of expeditions to Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean, led by a Muslim eunuch, uh, Zhong Ha. He attempted to reestablish trade links, and you can see this map showing the, the journeys of Zhong Ha. Um, and in addition to establishing trade links, wanted to basically establish tribute states, tribute states in Southeast Asia. Um, and bring those populations, especially places where you had overseas Chinese populations, back under Chinese control and influence. Uh, and this is moderately successful. Um, Zhong ha voyages, uh, Zhong Ha's voyages import some luxury goods, including giraffes like the one you see pictured here, and added as many as 50 countries to the list of tributary states to China. Um, however, over time, if you think of long distance trade, there was not a huge significant inc or not a significant increase in in trade between China and India and, and the Middle East more than more than had been. Uh, and it wasn't very profitable. And some of the reasons were that no new technologies come about that make these trips more profitable. They don't bring back much technology. Um, it was Often see, it was seen by a lot of people who were critical of this as a pet project of the Emperor Yung Law. Um, and most of the Chinese resources still were going to defense of its northern borders. The Mongols still were there. There were still other people pressuring uh, China's borders. And so uh, those resources were then given for defense and not necessarily for expanding uh, their maritime trade system. As far as Ming technology, um, they saw less technological innovation than what we saw under the Song Dynasty. Um, reasons for the slowdown in technical uh, innovation include uh, the fact that metals and wood were at high cost during this time. Um, there was, again, another renewed interest in civil service over, over commerce and being a merchant and improving technology. Um, the population of China was uh, recovering from the population losses under the Yuan Empire, and so there was much more emphasis on farming and agriculture uh, during this time. And then certain technological secrets, they were simply just afraid that those would, would get out there. 
And so uh, because they're not sharing ideas very much with the outside world, we're not going to see an increase in technological innovation. In fact, Korea and Japan move ahead of China in technological innovation in many ways. Korea excelled in firearms, meteorology, shipbuilding, and Japan uh, passes China in mining and metallurgy and the making of steel objects um, and household goods. And so for the first time, we actually see kind of other groups moving past China in their innovation. That's not to say the Ming did not have achievements of their own. The early Ming dynasty saw a period of great wealth, consumerism, and cultural brilliance. Um, one uh, thing that we think about of the Ming, and you see pictured here, is porcelain, right? A Ming vase, that classic white and blue porcelain, um, which was highly valued, um, especially when Europeans start uh, arriving at China's ports. Uh, other goods, including, including furniture, silk, um, these are items that uh, the Ming uh, make and they're very prolific with. Um, they also uh, develop vernacular novels, um, and which become very popular in this uh, time period, like The Water Margin and Romance of the Three Kingdoms. So that's a, a brief overview of what we're going to come to with the Ming Dynasty, we will can pick up with them in our next unit. Uh, big ideas, keep in mind their achievements. Remember this guy, Zhong Ha. He's one of our three major travelers, including himself, Marco Polo, and even Batuta. Uh, so one of our major travelers who wrote uh, in this time period. And then also keep in mind the Mongol foundation of Ming China, what they rejected from the Mongols and what they accepted. All right, guys, that's all. Uh, you have a have a wonderful day.